Hi everyone, this is the final video of the Unit 7 video series. This particular video will go over contemporary ideas of personality and personality testing. So to start with, I want to review a couple of terms because this will matter for this video. So in the previous video, I focused a lot on the history of personality testing, and I spent some time talking about projective tests. Projective tests were widely used among psychoanalysts and psychodynamic psychologists who focus a lot of the, on the unconscious mind. I talked about Rorschach inkblot tests and the thematic apperception tests, which have a person project their inner thoughts and feelings onto an image so that the psychologist or psychiatrist could tap into the unconscious mind. Today, I'll focus a lot on personality inventories, which are more widely used today. Inventories are questionnaires that are designed to gather a lot of responses, um, a wide range of answer sets on someone's feelings, their behaviors, and their interests. And this is probably what you're more familiar with when thinking about personality testing. So I will start with the idea of personality traits because in inventory tests, inventory tests are assessing traits. So a trait is a characteristic pattern of behavior. It's a way that you feel and act. Um, it might even kind of be intertwined with your interests, but it's, it's considered a, a characteristic way of thinking and behaving. And sometimes you might even fall on a continuum. So if the trait is extroversion, you might be very extroverted or not very extroverted. And so sometimes traits can be on a continuum. Next, we have a factor analysis, and this is what personality inventories often do with the data they collect. So it's a statistical procedure that's used to identify clusters of related items on a test. For example, you might get a test report back that shows different clusters of information in different areas and where you have strengths and weaknesses and scores on a specific style of question. So a factor analysis is going to take a lot of that data and group it together so it's got an understandable score. An empirically derived test is a test that has been systematically tested. It is reliable and it is valid and it has gone through the testing process so that you can be confident that this is, is showing you the results that are consistent and that also predict what they say they will predict. One test that is empirically derived that is used in clinical settings for personality is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory or the MMPI that I will talk about here soon. So let's talk about some of the inventories that are commonly used or have been used in assess traits. So one of the first personality trait tests was the Ising test. And the Ising test was pretty simple. The Ising test was looking for um, just very simple traits. So the simple traits they were looking for were scales. The Ising test was created to see how introverted and extroverted a person was, so how, how um, sociable they were to maybe not so sociable on a continuum, as well as how emotionally stable to emotionally unstable they were. And so that was kind of what they were looking for, and it would put you on a continuum. They also uh, were highly regarded in their time because this was one of the first inventory tests that was more quantifiable where coming from some of this historical tests, if you remember about the ink blot or the thematic apperception test, that's kind of hard to um, compare information on, to um, quantify that information. And so this was considered to be, for its time, a really great test. Um, so you can see that there is a scale here of introversion and extroversion and stability and instability, and that's what Isink was looking for. They also created scales that helped them understand whether the person was, had, to what extent might they um, be trying to pick factors that were socially desirable or maybe even lying about themselves. And so that's one reason that this test was also very good because they had questions that could kind of detect whether they were being honest or not honest on this test. So that's the Isaac questionnaire. Next, we have the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Test. This is a test you probably will not find on the internet. The reason is this is a standardized psychometric test that tests adults' personality, and it's used primarily by mental health professionals, and their hope is to either create treatment plans or diagnosis for um, abnormal personality traits. 
And so you're not going to see this since it's a clinical personality test. You're not going to see this online to find your interests. Um, but this is very widely used and clinically used today. And it helps to understand some of those and pick out and to find some of those traits that might be abnormal. So they would screen for things and detect things on scales of like being calm or even tempered and easygoing, um, all the way to um, uh, rigid and um, unstable and some of those traits that they're needing to detect for a clinical setting. Next, we have a test that is not used for clinical settings, but used to understand personality traits. And this is a very common test today. It's called the Big Five or the Five Factor Model. And this was created by Costa and McRae. And their hope and their idea was to simplify personality traits because there are so many ways to describe personality. And so they felt like there were five major categories for personality traits. And all of these traits you can think of could be boiled down into these major clusters or categories. And they created the five categories of openness. And then you would, by taking this test, you would get um, a result that would be on a continuum very open or not so open to new experiences. The next one was conscientiousness, being spontaneous or being very predictable, um, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And so these different factors were kind of like big broad categories in which you could find yourself somewhere on the scale of being highly neurotic or not very neurotic. And so this was something that simplified this understanding of personality traits. And this, I think the easiest way to remember this is to put it in the acronym of OCEAN. I have seen some people put it in the acronym of CANOE, but sometimes students spell CANOE wrong and they miss one of the traits. So I think OCEAN is the easiest way to remember openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism as the big five personality traits. The next personality inventory that you are probably most familiar with is the Myers-Briggs. The Myers-Briggs is something that is used very commonly today to help students, to help adults find their interests and help a lot of times with leadership and career counseling. And this is what is the primary use for the, the um, Myers-Briggs typology indicator. And that's what helps um, a lot of time for coaching and helping you find your path. So one thing to keep in mind and just to be cautious of is this is pre predominantly a coaching tool. Uh, this particular personality test is not necessarily considered something uh, with a deep scientific foundation. Although Myers-Briggs are using those terms of introversion and extroversion, which are, are well-researched traits, this particular test was not something that was devised by psychologists. However, it does give students and adults an understanding of interests that they have. You, when you take this, we'll get a four letter personality type and you will either get an E or an I for your uh, introversion or extroversion scale, an S or an I for your um, sensing or your sensor and your intuitiveness, your thinker and your feeler, your judger or your perceiver. And you're gonna end up with this four letter um, trait. And a lot of times they'll give you some kind of uh, things to think about if these are your interests you might think about these career paths or uh, these different interests. But just know this is not anything that is diagnostic. Uh, this is more for coaching and leadership. So now we're going to move into different opinions about personality. One thing we focused on the previous video uh, predominantly was psychoanalytic psychologists and how they view personality as something that is unconscious and there's unconscious drives that are pushing you to act certain ways. We just went through trait theorists who feel like you have these um, characteristic traits that are key to who you are. Humanistic psychologists really focus on uh, what is called the self whenever they're focusing on personality. Humanistic psychologists are really focusing on their potential for growth. They see the person's goodness and their humanity, and they're trying to push you to self-actualization. So um, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, these are the huge figures in the humanistic movement. Carl Rogers, he was most known for his attitude of acceptance, and that's what he called unconditional positive regard. When you're working with someone, you uh, have 
for whatever they tell you and whatever they do, you accept them for who they are and you help get them to their personal best. Abraham Maslow felt that self-actualization was where he wanted to get people and that's what he focused on. And he felt like if someone was in this stage where they're not meeting their basic needs, he can't even get them to their, their best self of self-actualization. So some other ideas as far as personality, uh, the social cognitive perspective is where psychologists feel that there's actually an interaction between your traits and your social setting. So your social setting has an influence on the personality traits that you have. Reciprocal determinism comes out of that. This was uh, thought of by Albert Bandura, and he felt like it's actually this reciprocal, meaning they're all kind of working together and bouncing off each other uh, of your internal thought processes, your environment, or your situations and your own behavior actually all affect who you are kind of reciprocally. So your interests might be affected by your, your setting, but also by your behaviors and they might all kind of intertwine with one another. And so your personality might be a mix of those things. The behavioral approach says that you've actually learned the personality you have, you've learned to have those, those behaviors through possibly rewards or punishments or experiences in your life, you've learned and you've developed that personality. Positive psychology is a contemporary idea. It's a scientific study and it focuses on the optimal human functioning. It's hoping to um, help you discover your strengths in your community and help you thrive. This is really closely aligned to humanistic psychology and you've probably heard of positive psychology before. This is a really contemporary way of, of viewing the self. Uh, next, we have a, a debate in psychology, a debate about personality, and it's called the person, person situation controversy. And basically, this is a question that people have, and it's, are people's traits actually consistent across all situations, or is it dependent on the situation they're in? Are you, do you consider yourself outgoing in certain situations and not so much in other situations? And so this is this ongoing debate on what is true about our traits when is it actually just situational and is it just situational that we have those traits and so it's kind of an attempt to understand that next we have another factor that influences our personality and this is your culture so your culture might influence your interests and the way you act and behave and so an individualistic culture is going to place priority on your, yourself and your own goals and you being the best you and in western societies people tend to have individualistic cultures and they don't focus on the group. Whereas in collectivist cultures, uh, collectivist cultures tend to have a focus on society and helping improve the growth of the family and your extended family and your group. And your identity is more about the group as a whole than it is about the self. And so that might even affect the way that you act and behave and influence your personality because of your culture. And then finally, we have this piece of personality, um, the word self. There are so many terms in psychology that have the word self. So I put them all on one slide together and I will define them for you. They are so similar yet have these little differences. And so whenever we talk about personality, we're often talking about the self or different parts of the self. So first, the self is just considered the center of your personality, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. That's the self. There's also self-concept, and the self-concept is all the thoughts and feelings you have about yourself, like who am I and what do I like, and it's your thoughts about yourself. Your self-esteem is how you feel about your self-worth. Um, so you might have high or low self-esteem and how you feel about yourself. Self-efficacy is so similar. <laughs> self-efficacy is your sense of competence, of how well you do at things, how competent and effective are you at at your skills and how how do you feel about what you're able to do? That's self-efficacy. We also have a term called narcissism, which students are typically familiar with. Narcissism is when you have an excessive love for yourself or self-absorption. There's self-serving bias where you have a readiness to perceive yourself more favorably than you might perceive other people. And then finally, we have the spotlight effect. And the spotlight effect is something that happens and it's our tendency when we are with a group of people to overestimate how much we think other people notice us. So people are typically not noticing us as much as we think they are. And so it is our bias that we have this tendency to feel like we have this spotlight on us, that everyone is noticing us when in actuality, they're not noticing us as much as we think they are. 
So this whole video was about contemporary ideas of the self and personality and how we assess personality 